One thing that we humans pretty much always do is form imagery when we think of certain places. Sometimes the imagery can be incredibly diverse. If I ask you to think of the United States, what's the first image that pops into your head? Is it the Statue of Liberty in New York, the Hollywood Hills in LA, the Grand Canyon? Maybe it's a McDonald's, maybe it's Florida Man. Now compare this to France. What do you think of? I guarantee most of you thought of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Well, it's probably similar when you think of Gondor. You'll probably think of Minas Tirith, the White City, and that can't really be helped, it's iconic. But Gondor is a lot more than Minas Tirith, so in this video, let's look at the different regions of Gondor at the end of the Third Age. First, a look at Gondor's heartland, and the premier region is Anorian, the Land of the Sun. Anorian is Gondor's most important region, it's home to the capital of Minas Tirith, the townlands of the Pelennor Fields, and the minor port of Harlon situated on the banks of the river Anduin. It is also the location of the western half of the former capital of Osgiliath, now a bulwark against the threat from the east, along with the forts of the Ramasakor and the fortress on the Isle of Cat Andros. Anorion is the last of Gondor's regions to be located entirely north of the White Mountains, and in the vales of these mountains are the pristine Thirion Wood, as well as the little explored Druidan Forest, home to a remainder of the Druidine. It's also the location of Gondor's northern beacons, Amondin, Ilanak, Nardol, Erelas, Minrumon, Kalanhad, and Halithirion, which is situated on the borders of Rohan. As one of its founding regions, Anorion is home to a significant portion of Gondor's Dúnedain population, although thanks to the constant wars against the east, this population is dwindling by the year. Minas Tirith is home to only half the people it can hold, and much of the northern and western parts of Anorion seem to be deserted by the end of the Third Age, the population clinging ever close to the safety of Minas Tirith. Unlike the rest of Gondor's regions, Anorion is ruled directly by the steward. The other region in Gondor's heartland has had a far more deadly history, and that is Ithilien, the land of the moon. On the other side of the Anduin, Ithilien is a counterpart to Anorian, but is far more beautiful. The diverse forests, flowering fields, and bubbling streams are supposed to be enough to make you forget that the black slopes of the Ethelduath and Mordor are next door. And in its days of prosperity, it was home to Minas Ithil, the eastern half of the old capital of Osgiliath, and Emin Arnon, the place where the line of stewards originated from. But now, Minas Ithil is Minas Morgul, Osgiliath as ruined, and Emin Arnon is deserted. As Gondor's power waned, Ithilien would become the battleground against its enemies. The Easterlings would invade North Ithilien from Dagolad, the Haradrim would invade South Ithilien by crossing the river Poros, and Orcs would issue forth from Mordor and Minas Morgul from the crossroads, where the Great West Road and the Harad Road met. Its people, almost entirely of Dúnedain heritage, developed a reputation for becoming incredibly resistant to invaders, and they withstood many invasions, although they slowly dwindled. In fact, the last civilians only fled in 2954 of the Third Age, only a few years after Sauron returned to Mordor. However, the children and grandchildren of these last inhabitants fight on, many of them forming the rangers of Athelion, who operate from the secret refuge of Hanath Anun. In that sense, Although Gondorians no longer live in Ithilien, Gondor has not relinquished the land and still contests it against Sauron's armies. Like Anorian, Ithilien was probably ruled directly by the steward, and in its earlier days, it was probably governed by a leader in Minas Ithil. Another of Gondor's founding regions is Lebanon, the land of the five rivers, the Anduin, the Kelos, the Sirith, the Cerny, and the Gilrain. Lebanon is one of Gondor's largest regions, spanning from the Anduin in the south and east to Linhir in the west and the White Mountains in the north. As a result, and thanks to its rivers, Lebanon is one of Gondor's most populated regions. Although we don't know the makeup of this population, it can be assumed that it has a significant Dúnedain population thanks to the presence of Pelagir in the south. Speaking of Pelagir, Lebanon's chief importance comes from the city, the oldest city in Gondor and its chief port and naval base. This city has had a checkered history, being the source of the Kinstrife Civil War and the target of Corsair raids. Despite that, the city and the region of Lebanon in general are the first line of defence against the threats from the south. We're unsure of who rules Lebanon, but as one of Gondor's fiefdoms, it likely has its own ruler, probably based out of Pelagir. The last of Gondor's founding regions that survived the Third Age is Belfalas, also known as Dor and Ernil, the Land of the Prince. 
Once upon a time, Belfalas was Gondor's westernmost region, ruled by a faithful Numenorean family that would eventually become the line of the princes of Dol Amroth. From the city of Dol Amroth, these princes rule over a powerful fiefdom, home to the elite unit known as the Swan Knights. But Belfalas isn't just Dol Amroth. On the other side of the unnamed hills that dominate much of the cape lies the important town of Linhir, situated on the border of Lebanon. To the north is the ancient elven haven of Ethelon, abandoned now for over a thousand years. Like Lebanon, Belfalas has a large population, most of whom claim descent from Numenor. Interestingly enough, it's the one place in Gondor where Adunaic names are still common. At the time of the War of the Ring, the ruling prince of Dol Amroth is Prince Imrahil, and after the steward, he is the second most powerful man in Gondor. Many of Gondor's regions were absorbed or conquered many years after its founding, and these regions were largely populated by indigenous peoples related to the Men of the Mountains and the later Dunlendings. The closest of these regions is Losanak, a name of both Sindarin and pre Numenorean origin that its meaning is unknown. Losanak is a land of mountain valleys known for its flowers. One of these valleys is Imloth Melwi, the Sweet Flower Vale. Although the exact borders of Losanak is unclear, it appears to run down to the Anduin to the east and south, but the western border is unlikely to be the Sirif, as Pelagir, which is part of Lebanon, is on the eastern side of that river. As I said earlier, Losanak was largely home to men of indigenous Gondorian stock, and they are noticeably shorter and darker than the Dunedain and have an affinity for axes. However, in the later years of the Third Age, many refugees from Ithilien fled to Losanak, Baragon's family amongst them. During the War of the Ring, most of the non-combatants from Anorian were sent to Losanak thanks to its relative safety. During the war, Losanak was ruled by Lord Forlong the Fat, although in advancing years, faithfully led his soldiers to help defend Minas Tirith. Moving west, we encounter one of the smaller regions and fiefdoms in Gondor, the Ringlow Vale. As the name suggests, the Ringlow Vale is a small region centred on the River Ringlow, wedged between the lands of Lebanon, Lamadon, and Belfalas. Very little is known about the Ringlow Vale. It is the location of Ethring, which is an odd one. Amongst the community, Ethring is commonly thought of as a town, but on the map, it actually has the marks of merely being a crossing. In saying that, Ethring's strategic location makes it an obvious location for a town. Whatever you believe, it makes such little impact that it doesn't matter. During the War of the Ring, the Ringlow Vale is ruled by an unnamed lord, but his son, Dervarin, is named. Continuing on the trend of small regions, let's go south to the Ethir Anduin, the Mouth of Anduin. Much like the Ringlow Vale, Ethir Anduin is a small place, consisting of the river delta of the Anduin and the nearby coastline, and not much else. The island of Tolfalas may have belonged to the region, but the island was in all likelihood uninhabited. There are no named towns or major landmarks, and the people that come from the region are described merely as fishermen, probably few in number considering the dangerous frontier location. But despite its size, the Ether Anduin is of major strategic importance. It controls one of the few viable crossings of the Anduin, and of course, it controls all of the traffic into the river. As a result, it was the launch pad for the numerous invasions of Harad and Umbar led by Gondor's ancient kings. It's unknown if the Ethir Anduin had its own ruler, but considering they send troops to Minas Tirith separately from Dol Amroth and Lebanon, which doesn't actually send any troops, it can only be assumed that they are outside both of those regions' jurisdictions. Heading back west, we reach the land of Lamadon. This is a relatively small land, wedged between the Ringlow Vale, Morthond, and the White Mountains, and a small range of hills known as Tarlang's Neck. Like Gondor's other mountainous regions, Lamadon is a region of valleys, dominated by the river Kirill that flows into the Ringlow. Its main town and capital is Kalambel, but it's also described as having many homesteads and hamlets throughout the valleys. The region is populated by those uh, mostly of indigenous Gondorian heritage, and is home to one of Gondor's more primitive peoples, hillmen that inhabit the various hills in the region. At the time of the War of the Ring, Lamadon is ruled by Angbor the Fearless, who takes command of much of the defense of western and southern Gondor. Further west again is Morthond, more commonly known as the Blackroot Vale. Deep in Gondor's territory, the Blackroot Vale is separated from Lamadon by Tarlang's Neck and borders Pinafgelan in the west and the coastal region of Anphalas in the south. These western and southern borders are rather unclear, 
but either way, the Blackroot Vale is probably one of the safest places in Middle-earth, but not without fear, considering the proximity of the Paths of the Dead and the Cursed Hill of Erech. Still, the Blackroot Vale is a land of fertile grasslands and woods, with the River Morthond in the centre of it all, home to skilled archers who probably start as hunters. Like many of other Gondor's interior regions, the population of the Blackroot Vale is likely mostly of indigenous Gondorian heritage, but there might be some Numenorean heritage too, considering Isildur did take the Stone of Erech there. During the War of the Ring, the Blackroot Vale is ruled by Lord Dwyn here. The last of Gondor's interior regions is Pinath Gelin, the Green Hills. As the name suggests, Pinath Gelin is a land of hills, and given the fact that they are apparently green, it's probably quite a pleasant land. Little else is known of Pinath Gelin, including its exact borders, but given the empty space out that way, it appears to be quite large. However, one could probably come to the conclusion that it is a sparsely populated land compared to the more eastern lands. By the time of the War of the Ring, Pinath Gelin is ruled by Lord Hirluin the Fair. The last of Gondor's traditional regions is Anthalas, the Langstrand, the Long Beach. Unlike many other regions, Anthalas's borders are easy to define. It's a long strip of land along the coast, running from Ethelond in the east to the river Lefnui in the west, and bordered on the north by the hills of Pinath Gelin. From what little we know of Anthalas, it's a distant region and is relatively poor and probably sparsely populated, given the equipment of its soldiers during the War of the Ring. But despite its distance, like the other coastal regions, it was often under threat from the Corsairs of Umbar and, far from any help, the region probably suffered dearly from these raids. Still, Anthalas was a faithful thief of Gondor, with hunters, herdsmen and men of little villages coming to the aid of Minas Tirith. It was ruled by Lord Galasgil. I said last of the traditional regions before because there is one final region that sort of belongs to Gondor, if only in name, Andrast, the Long Cape. Unlike most of Gondor's other regions, the Numenorians never made an attempt to settle in Andrast, and that didn't change in the Third Age, although its coastline was patrolled in the days of Gondor's power, and there was a beacon at the end of the Cape. In fact, the men of the Anthalas believed that the Druidine lived in the mountains that ran along the Cape, whether that was true or not, we'll never know. To summarise, if Andrast was nominally claimed by Gondor, Gondorians never actually lived there, and it remained a wilderness till the end of the Third Age. Of course, Gondor was once much larger, and there are several regions that Gondor once claimed that were abandoned before the end of the Third Age. I'll speak briefly about them. Perhaps the most well-known of these regions is Kalanadon, the rolling green grasslands which would eventually become Rohan. It was always sparsely populated in comparison to the rest of Gondor's lands, but was still strategically important, boasting the fortresses of Aglarond and Angrenost, that's Helm's Deep and Isengard, and securing Gondor's northern frontier. Unfortunately, Kalanadon was also disproportionately affected by events such as the Great Plague and Easterling invasions, and the dwindling population ended up either congregating in the western part of the province, some of them later mixing with the Dun Lendings, or moving east to hold the line of the Anduin, which was overrun by the Balkoff in 2510. Following the Balkoff Easterling invasion, Stuart Kirion gifted the region to the Aetheode, and it became the Kingdom of Rohan. Further west, Gondor also claimed sovereignty over the lands of Emedwaif. Gondorians never actually properly inhabited this region outside of the town of Tharbad, which was jointly maintained along with Arnor. That was because most of Emedwaif was peopled by the descendants of the Glytherim, such as the Dunlendings, who were somewhat hostile to the Dúnedain and generally liked to be left alone. And outside of maintaining the north-south road, Gondor never exerted much control over the region. Anadwaif was abandoned by Gondor following the Great Plague of 1636 due to Gondor's need to withdraw its outer garrisons, and the newly independent region began to fall into disrepair. By the end of the Third Age, Tharbad was ruined, and the roads were overgrown, making travel from north to south exceptionally difficult. One of Gondor's more important outer regions was Horondor, also known as South Gondor, the land between the River Poros in the north and the Harnan in the south. We know little of the geography of this region, but given its proximity to the sands of Arad, it might have been a dry, semi-arid land. Alternatively, it might have also been similar in climate to Athelion. Hirondor was conquered by Gondor during the 9th century reign of King Taranon Falaster. It was firmly in Gondor's hands until after the Kinstrife, which ended in 1447. For many years afterwards, it swapped hands between Gondor and the allied Corsairs and Haradrim. 
By the reign of Stuart Turin II, who ruled in the 29th century, Herondor had been completely conquered by the Haradrim, although it was hardly a prize at this point, because the centuries of constant fighting had left the land largely deserted. Further south was Haradwaif, or Harad, the land peopled by the Haradrim. King Hjalmendikil I of Gondor defeated the Haradrim in 1050 of the Third Age, and as a result, Gondor took control of much of this desert land, or at least ruled it through tributaries. These lands were ruled from Umbar, which Gondor had conquered from the Black Numenorians 117 years earlier. Umbar was of major strategic importance, so when it fell to Castamir's traitorous followers after the Kinstrife, Gondor's influence over Harad waned. Gondor's power was restored in 1551 following a successful war by King Hjalmendikil II, but it again waned following the Great Plague. Gondor briefly reconquered Umbar under King Tulumatar, but it was lost for good following his death in 1850. The last of Gondor's old territories was a nameless expanse of land that belonged to the region of Ravanian, specifically the lands between the Anduin and the Sea of Rune, conquered by King Turambar in either the 6th or 7th century, and then cemented by Prince Minalkar in 1248. The northernmost parts of these lands were ruled by a Northman confederacy, later the Kingdom of Ravanian. Despite controlling these lands for over a thousand years, Gondor made little effort to colonize, and their presence was mostly just a military occupation. They did, however, begin the construction of a great eastern road that passed by the Black Gate, but it never got much further than that. This presence waned after the Great Plague, and Gondor was forced to relinquish all their lands east of the Anduin, save Ithilien, following the disastrous Battle of the Plains in 1856. From that point on, these lands became the home of various Easterling tribes. And that's about it. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it or at least found it interesting. I actually wrote a script for this about three years ago, but never made a video. Then about a year and a half ago, I rewrote the script and actually recorded the audio, but waited to make the video because I wanted to use stuff from Lord of the Rings Online's Corsairs of Umbar expansion, which was coming out later that year. But after the expansion dropped, I never ended up making the video. But now, finally, after several years, I've done it. What a journey. Cheers, farewell, and remember, for some reason I wrote this script in huge paragraph blocks and tried to read them all in one take. It's very infuriating when you make a mistake on the final sentence and then feel like you have to re-record the whole paragraph. That's efficiency.